afternoon, everybody. Hello. Good to see we pulled a crowd. Thanks for making it and staying awake. Uh, I'm Noel Mengel. I'm the music writer at the Courier Mail, so I've been interviewing Ian for a while uh, and grilling him with the tough questions. And I'd like to introduce you to Ian Hogue. Hello. Ian, how did you get in this chair? Asho is a good manipulator, and he made me <laughs> agree to do it, and I'm glad, I'm flattered to be asked. But uh, I suppose I started playing music because uh, my brothers played music, yep. uh, played guitar. They didn't do it professionally. They're both doctors now, actually, so I was kind of the black sheep in the family. And uh, I think my parents always probably still think I should get a real job one day. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so I started playing in venues around the valley when I was about 13 or 14. And not getting kicked out, yeah, obviously. No, there was, you just would photocopy your idea, liquid paper it out, and I don't know, I mustn't have looked 18, that's for sure. But So, uh, yeah, places called The Outpost and The Love Inn and Op Shop, stuff like that around here. Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the people I talk to... Um, Many of them are early starters. I don't think there's any sort of substitute for doing some kind of, you don't think of it as an apprenticeship. It's just fun, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so what was your first band? My first band was called The Vibrance. And that was with uh, Marcello, who ended up in The Tooth Fairies, and a guy called Brett Barton, yeah. um, who's in bands in, around Sydney now, and a guy called Hedge, who was in Dementia 13, and some other Brisbane punk rock bands. I interviewed Ian a couple of years ago talking about, uh, you know, when Powderfinger played that Queensland 150 gig and we were talking about you know, the Brisbane scene of, of the 80s, uh, there were places to play. Yeah, yeah. But there was also a, an ugly phenomenon of pretty much... Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, ugly phenomenon of, like, a covers circuit. I mean... I think every band should start off playing covers in a way because that's how you learn how to play your instrument. And rip stuff off, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> There's nothing to be ashamed of there. But, um, yeah, it was, it was quite difficult to, when, to get gigs in that window when Powderfinger started. A bit earlier it was great, but in the 80s I think it was great. But then in the late 80s, early 90s, yeah, it was, you had to be on Hutcho's books and do the cover circuit if you wanted to make any money as a musician anyway. Mm. I was never doing it for the money really anyway. We were all on the dole quite happy. And, uh, you know, we, I suppose we were a case study for the dole in the end. We told them what we were doing and had a case manager and they let us, you know, receive payments. Mm. <laughs> well, we'll s step back a bit. Um, so, so what were the records that were turning you on that made, made you want to play guitar? Um, well, I was pretty lucky, as I said, my brothers both play guitar, but they're mu like music like Slade and Led yeah. Zeppelin, T-Rex, Bowie and the Beatles and stuff was always in the house. And one of the first songs I ever tried to, or got taught, after they, they both taught me how to play 12 Bar Blues so that they could solo over the top of me pretty much. Yeah. Just, <laughs> like, and... Uh, so I'd do that all the time, and uh, but yeah, I remember being taught Jumpin' Jack Flash, and I just played that for the Rolling Stones song for days, and it was wrong the way I learned it. So <laughs> I still play it the wrong way, but yeah. Yeah. So you you didn't have the open G tuning. No, then. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was turning on. But then a little bit further on, I was I was a uh, um, I wasn't very good with the ball sports really. I was a bit scared of getting hurt in rugby and stuff. So I was a swimmer. And one of the dudes that did swimming, a guy called Scott Lambert, he was a bit older than me, he introduced me to R.E.M., gave me a record called Reckoning by R.E.M., which I thought was fantastic, because I was about 13 or 14 or something. Mm. And then he gave me, uh, which I you know, dubbed onto tape, piracy, for, uh, the old way. Mm. And, uh, and um, then he gave me a little yellow record, the yellow EP of the Sunny Boys, and I'd never heard of them. And that was a bit of an epiphany for me to discover them, and th that's what made me want to be in a band, that record. Yeah. And then I shortly after that discovered Stone Age Romeos by Hootie Gurus and went on this, joined a mailing catalogue, all go-go records, and uh, they just 
send my five bucks in the mail every week, five dollar note or whatever, and they'd send me singles back every week of Moodists and Tough Monks or whatever. Cool. Did, did you know the guitarist on the Stone Age Romeos came from Brisbane and yeah, not far was, away? Yeah, well, he went to the same school I did, so. Right, that's he, Brad Shepherd. Yeah, 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 it was a bit of, bit of a legend about him. No one knew him, but you know, there was all the stories about him. Yeah, yeah. School. Uh, so you went through the early bands, uh, somewhere along the line you met JC, mm. uh, and, and you started playing together, yeah. Yeah, the bond was, I saw him at school on the sports ground wearing a, a non-uniform um, t-shirt that had the Sunny Boys printed on it, <laughs> and I was like, oh, hello, who are you? <laughs> and yeah, it was kind of, we started the band, we were both in bands at school, different ones, not with each other, and then the Christmas holidays just after school. JC and myself and Bish was the original drummer mm. of Powderfinger, Stephen Bishop, and uh, yeah, we started jamming straight after school. Mm. Uh, I, th I think there's this thing that uh, happens now, maybe because it's an instant world, people think something good can happen in five minutes or in six months, yeah. and Powderfinger are the perfect example that doesn't. No, I mean... When we were a three-piece, we were together as a three-piece for maybe two years before yeah. I met Bernard at uni. And then Bernard joined and um, we were still doing... An, we'd actually went in a rock awards as a three-piece and we did pretty well. And then when he joined, they bagged the shit out of us, said that we didn't know what we're doing, that we couldn't decide if we wanted to be ACDC or Neil Young, pretty much. And, you know, it was, I guess that was because we liked both those bands. Mm. and. Uh, yeah. I, think I, I think I ripped that off for a review once. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you so then, yeah, and then Darren joined, sorry. And so that, that had all, that was about four years or something like that. And then when we hadn't done any proper recording by that stage. And then Bish left. And uh, we'd sort of done all of these gigs at Club ACs, which is a biker club in the valley. We used to play lots of biker places because they paid money. And mm. from t midnight till four in the morning kind of vibe every night for a month or something like that and uh, yeah we say so we saved money to do our first recording but then Bish left the band so we had to audition for a drummer and uh, so that was you know four or five years into it pretty much before we got Cogsy and then mm -hmm. it's been the same lineup ever since of course but there's no substitute for that the Hamburg years really is there mm. you know or whatever you want to call it uh, so yeah, you did I it know. yeah I mean we did the we were sort of the last, one of the last batch of bands, I think, to, you know, where road crew were just fucking awful to you. They'd make you lug in and lug out, and they were really mean, you know, they'd play tricks on you and stuff. And so I we know, always made I sure know, that we didn't yeah. do that to bands, but yeah, I mean, it's character building, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know, we, it, it's sort of romantic to look back at it, but at the time, a lot of that sucked. And we did, a, you know, we spent a lot of time in bands, and most of the time it was hot fun. But yeah, bands, I think, miss out on a bit not doing that. Yeah. And the old what doesn't kill you kind of thing. Mm. Uh, um, that Brisbane scene then, did you, was there a scene? Was there a, I don't know. I was talking about this with Glenn um, last night. It's like Custard were doing similar things as as we were really, it was the same thing, you know, they were staying in Brisbane and we weren't friends with those guys at all. We didn't dislike them, we just didn't run in the same circle. So there was definitely their scene and then there was the scene that we were in that other bands like maybe um, Lemongrass and um, I don't know, more of, this, more of the bluesy sounding bands I guess would play together. Mm -hmm. And some, then we, we sort of decided that we were going to get heavy for some reason and then that first album happened. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, we were playing with, you know, a lot of a different scene again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but that was in the air. Yeah, it was long, the long hair, long hair yeah. and loud guitar. And yeah, totally. Guitar. Well, Soundgarden probably was the, the, you know, what everyone was aspiring to be. But it was the target building, I think, that, you know, everyone was in the same rehearsal rooms and you could go and stand outside a room and listen to what people were doing. It was pretty cool. Mm. Uh, the Brisbane band scene that I was in in 78, 83, like getting to Melbourne and Sydney, you might as well thought about going to the moon, really. Mm. Uh, 
things had changed to a degree, you were able to start getting out of Brisbane yeah. and building something. We should point out for people who might have been not born, then uh, there wasn't really a... Triple J wasn't a national broadcaster yet. No. Um, things were very different. It was a different kind of world. There was these different regional cities that yeah. were a long way apart. So you had to go there. We went there every six weeks. I think we went to Melbourne, drove to Melbourne 40 times or something stupid. So every six weeks you'd jump in, play. And not even really stopping at regionals. It was just to go you mm. know, drive to Geelong and play to six people. A, a, a thing that most people, bands have... You've got to share a sense of humour, haven't you? Mm. Really. Got to make each other laugh to, to put up with yeah, it. Yeah, totally. You've got to learn how to push each other's buttons. Mm. The right and wrong way. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is pre-mobile phone, so you'd have to organise shit before you left. And, and um, Baz, our lighting guy, finally, Paul Patik, our manager, gave Baz his old phone, which would never work. So he, one time he threw it at the windscreen and smashed the windscreen. So it was so frustrating. Mm. But, um, yeah, we had two vans sometimes, and... You'd play tricks on each other and you'd be driving along and you'd look behind and the, you could, it's like the other car had disappeared and they'd be hiding behind a tree out in the desert and then you'd, it was pretty funny. You'd go <laughs> looking for them and you'd get back and you bastards. Like after an hour of, because you thought something was wrong obviously and they're just waiting at the hotel going, mm. in mm. Tamworth going. Yeah. And then you had that character building thing. Yeah, Geelong, eight people on a, yeah, how did we get booked here on a Tuesday kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you, you're able to, learn how to be yourself in those kind of gigs, I think. Yeah, well, I think, I don't know, you can do, we used to practice a lot, we used to write a lot, and we never really did that at night time, we always did it during the day, mm. sort of practiced, you know, from 10 till 3 every day, or whatever, mm. and uh, so, but there's, you can't replace the gigs, so playing gigs is better practice than, than rehearsal, I reckon. Yeah, we did a lot of that. Yeah. Well, on the subject of reverses, uh, you went heavy. Uh, oh, look, th here's one thing I wanted to say. There's, there's a thing in common. In, in Brisbane, up until a certain point, there was a really... It had to be do-it-yourself. And, and this, that same thing applies to the Saints. It applied to the go-betweens. Mm. And it applied to you. You did an EP. Yeah, you know, there was nobody yeah. helping you. You had no. to do it. And, and to get in the game, th those three very famous bands from Brisbane I've just mentioned, they, they all had to get in the game yeah. on their own steam. So that EP was really important. Yeah, we did too. We did the one that was um, just called Powderfinger and I think we pressed a thousand of them, of which a whole lot of them were stolen actually from our house in Turinga. So someone's still got heaps of them. They go for like 400 bucks on eBay or something. That they pop up every now and then. But, um, Gee, yeah, I put so mine up there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so we, we'd never take money from gigs and we just always compile, you know, put it in and save for those. We save for that, and then we save for the next one, which was called Transfusion. And but we got lots of record company people came. We played at that old. Um, it's down in, under the Mine Centre, the Metropolis, and it was Chockers, and the record company signed us from that launch, really. Mm. And uh, yeah, for him was he was one of the responsible ones. Actually. For people who. Don't know the the Brisbane story. Um, uh, bands since the beginning have really had to get out of town, and Powderfinger were historic. Uh, not only did they not get out of town, they didn't want to get out of town. No, uh, it was only ten hours in a van to Sydney. So, so uh, until that point, bands really left. Mm. Um, Powderfinger were one of the first to try and make it work from here. Was that a deliberate decision? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, all our friends were here, girlfriends, you know, so... And it's just heaps better lifestyle up here, I think. I love visiting Sydney, don't get me wrong, but I mm. couldn't live there. Mm. Musicians need mm. cheap rent and somewhere they can yeah. rehearse for cheap. Did you have a rehearsal room? Did you have a house? Or? Yeah, we always had a rehearsal room, a Target building, one across just down here. That w I think we paid 30 bucks a month or something to have a room in there and... It was, you know, you could afford it. And so you didn't have to set up your gear every time you rehearse. It makes a big difference. Mm. And then, yeah, we had another one in the middle, uh, just over the road from City Hall. And you could hear the music f all through the city, but you couldn't work out where it was coming from. So we never really got in trouble. But, yeah. And that was when we were writing for parables. So I feel sorry for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, let's get to parables. Um, you did it. Uh, it wasn't that well received, and you're probably expecting it. Things had gone pretty well in the last year before that, and it was a bit of a yeah. reverse, wasn't it? I've, I think I've listened to parables twice in the last 15, 20 years. But, um, you know, there's a couple of... The problem with it is every song has about five songs in it, and we could, it, maybe it would have been good if we didn't try to cram everything into each song. But uh, some English journalist who was genius said, we send them the convicts and they send us this. <laughs> yeah. What did you think? Well, at the time, I think we were, we were, I mean, we're definitely proud of it. We thought it was a great leap forward. But in fact, if you take that out of the scheme of things, the EPs to Double Allergic were, was a natural progression. So, And yeah. there was another EP in there, Mr. Nebine, actually, after Parables, which didn't sell many either. But it was kind of, you could see where we were yeah. finding our feet again. Yeah. So was, was there a, a, a thing where the band sent, sat down and said, right, something's gone wrong, what can we do right? Or, or what was, yeah, what, what was or, the reaction to it? Well, I think more what ha might have happened was when we were playing at gigs, and this is the, the total peak of stage diving and crowd surfing and shit like that, and it, you know, you'd see quite a lot of violence in, in audiences and we'd stop when that happened. And then when we wrote, we wrote a song called Pick You Up and we noticed that the first time we played that was in Lismore at the Workers Club or something. Yeah. And uh, when we played that, we just noticed that everyone actually sort of danced more than slammed into each other. And I think we, I don't know, we liked that. And people could understand it because it didn't go from 7, 8 to 3, 4 to all these time signatures. Mm. I think Parables was more of an album for musicians than for mm. normal people. Mm. Uh, uh so can you remember, I mean, we, we probably sit here for days and hear all kinds of talks about, about the business and what to do, but, I mean, the basic crux of it is nobody would be sitting here if they didn't write good songs yeah, yeah. and Pick You Up was a huge deal. I think a really interesting thing about Powderfinger and a lot of bands that succeed is is the multiple songwriter thing. Mm. Uh, um, and maybe people outside the band don't know how that worked. So how did it work? That, it, For instance, in, in Pick You Up, like how does a song like that come together? Well, that was, that was pretty much a Bernard creation, that one. It was, he played it on this guitar his mum had bought him for 30 bucks. And uh, an open C tuning. And uh, it just, the whole sound comes from that guitar. And we, we pretty much all just played along on that and you know, worked out the dynamics and the mm. structure with him or whatever. But I think that was one of those examples of a song that was written in 20 minutes sort of thing though. Mm. So had you and had we all, one... We all, no, that was the first time that had been, we hadn't really um, over considered it or something. We just, mm. went, this feels good, let's do it. Mm. And we've all, we all took in songs that came together easily, but a lot of the, most of the time we thought pr sometimes probably too much of that stuff. Mm. Well, I, 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 I think every musician does, you have to learn how to be simple, don't you? Yeah. And, 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 and to, to play, learn, play through a PA system. Yeah, yeah. And to learn when not to play, I think, is, especially with two guitars. I think Darren and I, after Parables, that's when we learnt that. It's like to give a bit of space to the music. It was mm. actually stopping sometimes. So. Mm. so I think that's an important tip for musicians out there to take. You've got to take your time. To I've been interviewing musicians for 30 years, and mostly it's because they... They write good songs and they sound like themselves, you know, yeah, and it yeah. takes time to get there. Mm. Well, I don't know, maybe one of the reasons we had some longevity was because we weren't really doing it to please anyone else. We were trying to keep ourselves interested and mm. not really copying anyone else, I think. Mm. Mm. A, lot of, a lot of bands try to be sort of fashionable or something. And we you weren't. certainly weren't fashionable in no. Sydney, were you? Yeah, you, you know, when you no, first no. started going down there, they oh, thought, no. who yeah. are these hairy yeah, yeah. yokels from up north? Totally. Mm. But in retrospect, it's, that, that was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, we fit in a new town, all right, that was okay. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. Uh, I should say, even though it's in darkness out there, we'll, if anybody's got a question at any time about the things we're talking about, you just yell out because it's Friday. Heckling is welcome. So, so if you've got anything you'd, you'd like us to focus on, 
uh, by all means, just because we probably can't even see your hand, so so yell out at any time. Uh, uh, everybody talks about that word chemistry; it becomes a bit of a cliche. Uh, uh, it's to do with work, isn't it? And working at it. Yeah, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of the, the panels over this thing, and I think it comes up. The you know, there's at least three things you've got to be persistent and you've got to stick at it but there's a whole lot of luck going on and if there was any formula that anyone knew then everyone would do it so hmm. um yeah i think persistence i mean looking at music scenes as they are like looking at what's happening now that the and i think this would happen at any time in history you'd say oh there's a lot of formula stuff going on i think so i think as soon as there's one band in a particular style and 20 pop up. But I think a lot of the time too, those ba other bands have always existed. It's just that radio then decide that they're going to play all the other ones. Mm. They, they've all, already existed. It's not like these bands are just forming and mm. s copying. Like, I'm just glad the sport metal period's done with. That was pretty tiresome. <laughs> uh, in terms of the progression, okay, pick you up. You got a hit record. Yeah. And you've got to step up uh, to the plate or you've got to step up to bat mm -hmm. when you've got a hit record. It's a hot, you, you can tell, you're looking out in the audience, you, you, you're playing a different kind of, it's not your friends and, no. and, and, that's and when a we few got musos. To, we got to do that thing before Crowded House Farewell at the Opera House at about, with those songs. Mm. And we would have never been asked to do that if that album didn't exist, if it was Parables mm. songs, we wouldn't have been asked, I don't think. But... um. Yeah, I think well, Tim Whitten, there was heaps of stuff that happened at that time. We worked with Tim Whitten. He made it sound different from anything that was around, I think, for, particularly for our style, and that worked in our favour. Mm. Mm. I mean, Tony Cohen on Parables wasn't in a good state of mind when he worked on that record, mm. pretty much. It's an interesting balance, like, to actually seek originality for itself where you might wind up with Parables. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you, you know, yeah. You know Yes, you need to be original, but to go and seek it too, it's a very fine line to walk. Oh, totally. Like, it, I mean, the common journalist thing was that it, the album lost its head up its own arts, and I tend to agree, like, because it was, we tried to put too many ideas in. Yeah. And, you know, you can't care about what the press says. We didn't take it personally, but at the time we are like, oh, maybe mm. I think they're right, you know. Mm. Were, were you a simpatico bunch with your musical tastes? Were you, were you no, not at all. Mm. Bernard and I's, t my taste is pretty similar because he's got, who's, his older brother's passed away now actually, but his brother was pretty much the same age as my brother, so we had the same um, musical palette to draw yeah. from, I, from, I guess. Yeah. But uh, JC was into totally d different stuff except for the Sunny Boys and I, he and I agreed on that, but he was more into, um, oh, I don't know. Joy Division, whereas I like the Cramps and the Gun Club. So. Yeah. And then there's Darren. Darren <laughs> liked, um, yeah, Racer X and like shredding guitar metal. So. And the cape. The cape, yeah. <laughs> Medieval stuff. <laughs> and the private joke is that one of the early Darren bands, there was a cape involved. Yeah, Pirate, uh, I think the band was called. Playing at the Actually or something like yeah, that, yeah. probably. Oh, no, that was Sonic Tapestry. Oh, Sonic been. Tapestry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why that didn't take off, Sonic yeah, yeah. Tapestry. They thought they... Because we poached him from that band. They played, supported us at uh, Bonaparte's, and they thought that they blew us off stage that night. I remember him saying to us afterwards that they all sat around and they thought they just blew us off stage. Well, you have to think that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it was um, in the progression of the band... Uh, internationalist comes along uh, yes you've got an audience you're developing an original sound I, th I think a really important part of that progression was probably the day you come uh, that was another yeah, interesting song I think that was the first song really that we um, that was like a some kind of organic everyone contributed a thing and they just found this crazy unique groove that um, wasn't like anything else I think that we that we ever did or did again or anything that was around so mm. and then Nick Didier heard that song and ended up working with us from that song really mm. and then he did another four records with us so yeah that helped us 
jump to the next level, I think, that tune. And here was a really crucial find. Oh, yeah. Uh, and and I, I can imagine when bands are young, they're very dubious about producers. Yeah, totally. And we were, you know, reticent to work with a, an American because at that stage, I don't think we'd even been to America with, as a band. But, um, yeah, he's just a lovely, lovely like-minded person, really, mm. you know, self-deprecating, mm. normal human, and it just worked working with him. And it, was you, were you a band that had a lot of material, that was a lot of... Yeah, I think so. This, I mean, that was, it was great back then, though, because you could do, on B-sides, you'd put another five or six songs on, on your single, which mm. was, that was always fun to get rid of songs rather than have them sitting around. Mm. And they're coming, by this time, the band's doing a lot of co-writing, they're coming from a lot of different sources or... Mm. A bit of both. Like, it, people would take in songs, but there was a lot of jamming. There was probably too much of of um, the band being in there without Bernard, because he'd be, you know, forced to write lyrics to ten songs at once. It's, and he would, you know, consider everything, obviously. So then we'd present him with another 20 songs. It's like, write lyrics to them. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, so it, got, it would have been difficult for him, I think, doing it that way. Mm. But... Um, I don't know. I think some of our best songs got lost. I mean, I think that happens. You just over demo them and then they never get released. Mm. Mm. So they're still out there somewhere? I don't know. They're somewhere, yeah. Mm. Probably at Secret Services office. Uh, uh, I think a really important aspect of any import of any successful band is that team aspect. And there's some really different things about Powderfinger. Uh, you had your manager, Paul Patico, for your whole career. Yeah. You got successful, you didn't sack him. Like no. 99 bands out of 100 no. go up to the next level and they say, they move on. So that was really important too. Yeah, it was important. Like someone, I mean, I lived with Paul and he'd never worked in music before. Mm. And I could just tell that he, you know, we needed someone like him that could get stuff done and, you know, mm. and he loved music. Mm. So. And he was someone who... And he loved Australian music too, so that stuff like that I'd never heard of Tall Tales and True and all this stuff that he... I don't know, just different stuff. That, and yeah. he liked the Pixies, so I thought, yeah, he's got to be right. Uh, every band's different, but that that's great that you found the right person to grow mm. with you th through friendship, but he yeah, also... Yeah. He learned along the way. And, you know, I'm sure in retrospect, he and us would probably say that they'd, we could have done stuff differently, but you, so you can't ever look back like that I don't think uh, but we had this, not just him we had the same crew for 15 years a lot of them all our live sound people and guitar techs and stuff like that I think it's good to be faithful to people mm. and and they grew with you too from yeah. playing small tours to playing the biggest tours you yeah, could yeah. do um, were there tough times in that in you know when it, when, it, when a thing becomes successful it throws all kinds of pressures on on people yeah I mean when it's all going well and you go you know we're on the Coldplay tour or whatever in the States and you're getting good numbers to see you and getting well received and it all feels great you don't even stop and think about it but if you drive around America one time we had to like dodge tornadoes and stuff so you'd have to drive an extra thousand kilometers because there was a tornado and then you go to a town and you the person's forgot to promo it and there's six people there and stuff and it's not that nice living on a bus with ten boys, mm. if you can help it. <laughs> mm. You know, it's fun for a while, but after six weeks, the tenth time, it gets a bit much. And I've, I've talked to you all about this. It just about killed you. That was a lot of overseas yeah. touring, oh, yeah. and we it were, was really I think, tough. Yeah, two thousand and one. 2000 maybe or 2001 or something we were only at home for three weeks of the year or something like that so yeah mm. uh, it was but good fun most of it but, but it also got you to the level where you, you could do odyssey which um mm. stands it's, it's just a great rock record mm. uh whatever country you come come from and yeah was, i mean 9 11 which the anniversary was just the other day happened and uh, just as it was, was getting released in the States and then everything just fall apart, fell apart really because mm. of that, which was obviously a tragic event and everything, but it certainly derailed mm. us. Mm. 
And did it derail you internally? Was it deeply frustrating? Or no, I think it made us um, want to write a really great next record and just to focus on you know, doing good gigs at home. And, mm. yeah. and we should point out to people from an international audience who, pro who probably know, you know, most Australian bands really struggle to make an impression. It's really mm. rare. Uh, and most of the bands that do make an impression have to commit to not live here, don't they? And that's, that's a big decision. I think so. Mm. But I mean, you know, there's bands that, that um, moved straight overseas and did well over there and never did particularly well here. So, but I mean, it's a crime that UMI aren't massive still, mm. really. I mean, they're the one, one of the best bands in the world. But they, they just, for some reason, a lot of radio fodder takes over that. And I think, I think we're a better band than shitloads of bands that are on the radio and in America. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you, can't, you can't force people to like you, though. Uh, so, that timing, yeah, I mean, you, you'd made as good a records as you could make, so um, was there a, a decision then what we just can't go through this again to try and push it overseas that, you know, to the level that you had in um, 2000? No, no, we were pre prepared to give it another crack on Vulture Street because we had that bit of time off in there. And uh, I don't know, Nick encouraged us to, because uh, mm. we went to Atlanta to mix that. Mm. And uh, yeah, he thought it was going to work on the radio over there. So we gave it another crack and uh, didn't happen again. So. Mm. Uh, Vulture Street's a good great record. Um, proudly Brisbane because it sent a s signal to Brisbane people mm. and it, if you didn't come from Brisbane you didn't didn't have to know mm. about it. Um, uh, but you're in a really rocking frame of mind then. W yeah we just wanted it to sound like a party pretty much. Mm. To feel like a party to play and we I think um, all of the songs in Odyssey are well, most of them are fairly serious Maybe, we'll, you know, I, and we're not really a serious bunch of people, even though I'm really serious at the moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, and so Vulture Street was like a, a party. Mm. And, it, it, yeah, we had fun making that and playing those songs live. It was great. Yeah. I'm not sure if you said this to me, but certainly somebody in the band said to me at one point, the five of us left by our own devices mightn't have been as commercial as we, as we ended up together. Yeah, I think we were talking about that. Yeah. I, I don't know, I think, and you would never know, but I think sometimes when, because it was so democratic and everything, maybe ideas get diluted to something which is m maybe more palatable, palatable to mm. radio or something. Mm. I don't know. I, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a quandary. But, yeah, maybe that's the case. Mm. If we were, because like I would have wanted to sound more like the Stooges or something. and. Mm. Darren would have wanted to sound more like Crowded House, like Cleaner. Or, or, mm. So it's kind of all met somewhere in the middle. Mm. Uh, it's probably handy it was a five-way vote, don't you think? Yeah, no, totally. Like that, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think you can... You know, three Three-piece bands and five-piece bands, yeah. that two-way split in a four-piece band's tough. Yeah. And it was very rare that it was a four-against-one vote. Yeah. Except for the end, when I voted yeah. against <laughs> quitting. We'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it did work as a democracy, really, and, yeah, and totally. that split really helped it. Yeah. Mm. It was uh, always even Stevens on everything, so. Mm. Uh, it was sailing, uh, and you, you did some of the biggest Australian tours there's ever been. Mm. Um, maybe the biggest Australian tour, uh, when you toured with Silver Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the, the band just seemed to be really peaking to yeah. me as a, as a live. That was like the 15 years of work before mm. came to fruition and, and the 15 years of keeping this team together yeah. also came to fruition. I think so, and that Silver Chair and us did that together was great, I thought. It was, um, I don't know, did you ever see that photo of us skipping together, holding hands? Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That was People did try to kill that photo. Oh, we did try to kill it. It's like the sound of music or something like that. But, um, <laughs> It, um, it was sort of just, we were having a great time on that tour, everyone. They're, mm. you know, they're in a, 
similar situation to us in a lot of ways, even though Darren, Daniel was um, obviously a megalomaniac. I mean that in a nice way. He's mm. like, you know, totally in control of everything. Mm. But um, the band themselves, they were just great mates and sort of, yeah. Mm. Uh, here's a thing that doesn't get often brought up uh, at music conferences, but music, a bit like sport, is competitive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you, have, you have to beat the other guys to get to the top a bit. Yeah. Do you mean of other bands? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's healthy competition and then there's just, you know. Bitter competition. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd like to think that. It was healthy competition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they did end up winning more areas than us, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think they topped that version of On My Mind at the Arias that night. That was, that, was, fun, that, yeah. was, that was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, and actually the, the Arias performances were interesting to look back at because they always would, the first couple they even wanted us to mime and we're like, are you kidding? Like, we'd, we'd, never, we'd never do that. And yeah. all the TV shows and stuff used to make us mime and I think we were... And that grand final thing, they were not comfortable with us playing live. People, and then when we f did it, they're like, "Oh, bands can't play, can actually play live." You know, it sounds okay. Can I tell you my aria anecdote? The first time I went to the arias, there was a woman running around with a clipboard saying, "Where are all the Where are all the people for the mosh pit?" <laughs> <laughs> She's trying to tick off their names. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's her. weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is weird. Uh, but you managed to stay. I think most of the musicians I've talked to for 30 years, the successful ones, it often comes back to the same thing. Be true to yourself. And you, yeah. you, w you were able to do it. Yeah. And people out there might say, yeah, yeah, easy for them because they're successful. But yeah. it is a bit chicken and the egg. Yes, you were successful because you were true to yourself too. Yeah, it is chicken and the egg. I don't know. But ultimately, if we weren't successful in sales, still we would have been happy with the music we put out I think wouldn't have mm. it wasn't we did we didn't really pander to anyone's mm. decisions Elsa's decisions I don't think no one made us I mean p people would always go oh yeah I don't think you've got a single you need to write some more songs and that's totally fair enough that record companies do that and most of the time um, the record company people we worked with were great we had some bad experiences when there was some boss changeovers in in uh, Universal there's one particular guy that, like, said that uh, these days was a piece of shit. He did. He thought it wasn't going to work. And so mm. you got that one wrong. Mm. <laughs> um, a thing that bands, look, most most bands and artists, they get into because they want to do it. They don't. They're not doing it for fame or celebrity or anything like that. Yeah. And one of the great products, I think, of mu music is it's a people business and you meet some great people. And you made some great friendships along the way. One of them was Grant McLennan. Yeah. And for people from overseas, they might not know about this, but um, uh, Ian had this friendship with Grant McLennan from the Go-Betweens and they made some incredible music together. Uh, let's talk about that. That was a band called Far Out, Far Out Corporation. Yeah, the FOC. We, um, Jock from the zoo... I know Grant must have just moved back to Australia or something and for some reason Jock took it upon herself. She thought that we would like each other and so she set up a date at the zoo. I remember <laughs> walking up, this is all pre-mobile phone, blah, blah, blah. And so I remember walking up to the zoo and Grant was sitting in a booth reading a newspaper and the sun was shining on him, you know. And yeah. I remember he sort of, he had a, probably a glass of rosé or something sitting there. And um, I remember him walking up and he just folded the newspaper up neatly and sat there and said, hello. And then sort of from then we just became sort of, you know, inseparable in a way. Like mm. It was like a relationship, a boyfriend relationship without the sex. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, I don't know, we and decided pretty early on we were going to form this concept band and play one night at the Edward Street Theatre. It was just meant to be a, a one gig and to write all of the, the tunes we rehearsed in um, under my house in East Brisbane and Scott and Paul, these two awesome visual artists from um, Brisbane brought in these projections and just projected stuff on the wall and we sort of wrote to that. It was a pretty interesting process. Mm. And we did the one gig and Grant had never really just sung before, he'd always played guitar and so he was finding it free to, to bring out his crazy dance moves. Mm. And uh, yes, yeah, so after we did that gig, 
we thought we'd better record it and we recorded it and then did maybe 15, 20 gigs or something. And we were always just on the verge of doing the new one, but that never happened, sadly. So. Mm. Uh, but he's an inspirational character and, oh, yeah. and a great fan, not just of music, but of the arts. Mm. And I, it's a thing I wanted to talk about, and, and an inspiration I've always taken from Grant and other people who are successful. Um, they feed their head, mm. you know. He's uh, an avid reader, yeah. Yeah, so, so creativity. Mm. I'm an author, and most of the authors I meet, they're good readers. Mm. And most of the musicians I meet, they're good listeners and mm. other aspects of the arts. It's all, it's all part of creating things. Mm. Mm. I think so. Yeah. I've got a problem at the moment. I can't, I just, I've, I'm in a, a biography reading phase and I, I want to get back to fiction. So, yeah. Your book was the last good book I read, actually. Oh, oh. Yeah. Everybody should buy that book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay. You've, you've lived the dream. You had, yeah. And this is what most people who are here are thinking about. You know, how do we get to be in a successful band or at least uh, make a living out of it? Um, all good things come to an end. Uh, the day before your last gig, I wanted to speak to you, and I did, and I'm very glad I did. Uh, it was uh, Ian Hogue dissenting about the breakup of the band, um, and that's why I wanted to speak to you that, that day. You felt it was the wrong thing to do then, and I think you still do. Well, look, I've really enjoyed the time since we broke up and it's been a big pressure of trying to hold it together sort of thing. But now it's broken up. We can never come back. We're not going to do some fancy thing. And that's the first thing people normally ask me, are you going to do a fancy? It's like, no, we're not. Mm. Um, but I just thought it would be... Like, to never say never is one thing, but then if like doing this farewell tour would be ripping people off, obviously if we are going to do it again. I just thought we could have a big break, mm. you know, whether it be five or ten years or whatever, I don't care. But mm. uh, And I understand doing anything for 20 years, no matter how successful it is, does get to be a grind. There's a lot of compromises in a band. I guess it got to a point where there were too many compromises for too many people. Yeah, pretty mm. much. Mm. And, yeah, I was, I was Switzerland for a lot of that. I was... <laughs> the, you know, trying to remain neutral and mediate a lot of mm. dramas going down, but that's pretty exhausting to do too. So, mm. in a way, I've spoken to other members of the band. It does feel kind of nice to step out of the machine sometimes because a really big band does get to be a bit of a machine. Yeah, totally. And it's um, that last tour, I think we did undertake with the right mentality that we just wanted it to be a celebration. It wasn't some kind of morbid mm. thing, and we. All those gigs were good fun, and you know it's it's pretty good that we broke up before there was a fist fight on stage. Hmm. <laughs> w were there many good ones off? There was a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Who used to win? I was never involved in them. <laughs> <did, yeah. laughs> uh, Ian, I, whether you'd been in a successful band or not, you're, you're a music fan, a music nut, a guitar nut. Anybody who saw the last guitar. Powderfinger tour knows how much of a guitar nut he is because he just couldn't help showing off mm. uh, his guitars. Uh, you would have been involved in music somehow, possibly doing what you're doing right now. Yeah, I think I've always been fascinated with um, recording. And like, I remember when I was t you know, 10 or whatever, learning guitar, I'd record something onto one tape deck and then have another tape deck and you overdub and you keep going back and forwards or whatever that way. And it was inevitable that I'd end up buying four track, blah, blah, blah. And so I kind of was the the one in the band that, that sort of recorded a lot of the stuff in rehearsals and... But yeah, if I, if I think I would have done this sort of thing if Powderfinger didn't exist, who knows? I was and also studying architecture, so God knows I could be sitting in an office with a suit on. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Uh, and this sort of thing we should point out is Ian uh, has been a long time owner of Airlock Studios in Brisbane and uh, one, it's another passion of yours, but two, it keeps you in contact with people doing great things. I think yeah, there seems to be a flurry of good stuff going on in, in Brisbane at the moment, of which some of them come to our studio. And, and um, yeah, look, I, I get excited when I see good music. And whether or not I'm, I'm involved with bands, I just love to be able to point them in the right direction to good people. And, yeah. and um, yeah, so if anyone ever wants to ask, I don't charge for that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, I think introducing people 
that are going to help them is the most powerful thing you can do. Mm. Rather than you can't tell someone how to do something, they've got to work that out for themselves. Mm. Really. Yeah, and they've got to learn yeah. how to be able to do it for themselves. Yeah. I, I think a thing that happens in the music world still to this day, uh, almost the easiest thing to do is get the foot in the door in some ways because yeah. you're new and you've got that on your side. Mm. The toughest thing to do, and it was no different for Powderfinger or the Saints or the Easy Beats, mm. is to keep it flying. Yeah, yeah. I think it's awesome when people have a massive first record, but it's so much pressure. So in, a, in our career path, w in retrospect, we're kind of lucky that the first album flabbed it. But, uh, you know, we nearly got dropped from the label and everything, but they stuck with us. So we're, we're really lucky that that didn't happen. Hmm. But yeah, bands need to stick it out for longer than six months to see if they're going to make it. Hmm. What does uh, make it mean anyway? I mean, it's like, you know, as long yeah. as you're happy doing it, I think. That yeah, yeah. Uh, and you need to, I mean, a really important thing is to do what Powderfinger did and most of these other good bands uh, is sound like yourselves and yeah. you can't sort of do it overnight. No, and you mentioned like ripping people off before and I think everyone should. Mm. You rip off so many different things that it doesn't sound like one thing and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, because mm. that's how you learn how to, to eventually do something that is hopefully totally unique. Mm. It's, a, it's all a distillation of everything that's come before you. Mm. Mm. Um, think. We've had a great chat and we could probably go for another hour and we may do if we have a few more red wines, but um, uh, I would like to give people the opportunity to ask a question if they'd like to. So, love to hear from you. Um, I've booked a gig for us to play in December, so that'll be a good start. So, hopefully within, let's say, six months, nine months. Th that's the secret, isn't it? You've got to book the gig. Yeah, need book a the gig first, then, need a then everything else. Exactly. Mm. Musicians need deadlines, so mm. that's a good bit of advice. Yeah. Come on, let's ask some aggressive ones. There's so many people hated Powderfinger out there, haven't you? Yeah, bring it on. Where, where are the enemies? Um, I'm doing a couple of different things that I'm hopefully going to be proud of. I uh, I need to set a deadline on myself. So, but yeah, look, it was great to have last year off, and the start of this year has kind of been formulating the ideas. So I, I want to finish everything by the end of this year, really. I've met a couple of people at this thing that I want to work with, so it's, I'm inspired. Mm. You can book a gig soon. <laughs> yeah, come on, here's your chance. Yep. Out of all your guitars, what's your favourite? Mm. Um, I know it's a tough choice. Well, I really like my Les Paul, but that's, you can't play that standing up for too long, it's so heavy. So um, it's destroyed my back pretty much over 20 years. But um, so that, or I've got a mate in hollow body that I bought for 400 bucks, Sapphire. Yeah, right. Cool. While people are thinking of a question, I'll, I'll think mm. of one. As a muso, I've seen a lot of big outdoor shows for a long time. Powderfinger had the best acoustic guitar sound I've heard anybody have in your last couple of tours. Yeah, I thought... What was happening? Well, Mark McGilligot, our sound guy, got good all of a sudden. Oh. <laughs> you gave him some time to practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, we never had really fancy, took fancy guitars on the road because you're concerned about them getting damaged, obviously, to a certain extent. But um, we all just had matins and um, I think... When we, you mean when we did the, the highway men style thing to yeah, the side yeah, of the stage? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And um, so we all just had a different sort of a guitar. I think Darren played a 12 string. I played a, like a jumbo and Bernard played a smaller one. So they all sat in their own little mm. spot in the thing. But yeah, nothing nicer than a nice sounding acoustic and there's nothing worse than a really bad DI'd sound. Yeah. Sound, so yeah. yeah. Yes, this one.
Um, we were pondering for ages what our name was going to be. I was stuck on the concept, and this is before Silverchair too, so, but I was stuck on the concept of a name that wasn't the something. And um, we used to go and see this band called Bourbon Street that was a sort of a, from um, Lennox Heads or something down, down south, they were a covers band. And they played Powderfinger all the time, this Neil Young song. And um, I don't know, we were at Story Bridge Hotel drinking one night and Bish graffitied it in the toilet and that was how it became our name. <laughs> Greece. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Hello, we got one up here. Um, I think it was, um, most of the time it probably didn't. Most of the time the structure was put together and Bernard wrote a melody over it if it was a band thing. But if it was something he brought in, I'd, you'd have to ask him that. When I write songs, I would write the you know, structure and the melody of which the lyrics usually didn't stay. They were just a guide. I'd edit my lyrics so much that they, there's none left. That was Bernard's job. I've got one question while people are thinking. That last night, that's one of the greatest gigs I have. I'm, I've seen The Clash, I've seen a lot of bands. There was some, that last night at, uh, down at the River Stage, felt pretty good out there in the audience. How did it feel up there? Um, like a relief yeah. that we actually Probably. didn't play a really shit last gig. That would have been pretty <laughs> embarrassing. That would have been bad. But, um, yeah, look, it was, it was sad. I remember looking around at everything in the very, like, the last chord, sort of thinking, wow. But, um, yeah. Yeah. It was a pretty special place to play, actually, for the last one. Yeah. Do you mean the Tivoli or do you mean the, the big one? Yeah, the yeah. big one. Yeah. Mm. I mean the big one, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, come I forget on. about the Tivoli one. That was fun, but that was different. There's well, too there much seemed to, kill. to be a lot of alcohol there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Hello. He's going there. Hi. Uh, um, compared to back in your day uh, when you guys were happening mm. in the Brisbane music scene and now, there just seems to be, to my way of thinking, a lot of just a, a heap of fantastic music coming out of this town. Would you say that there are more bands coming along now than there were back, like in the 80s when you guys were happening? And how are all these bands going to survive and um, maybe be on a new power to finger? Like, can that happen? It just seems to be a saturation of fantastic music. Yeah, I think there's definitely more bands now, but there's more events like this where you get to see them all in one spot. Um, I think there's probably always been lots of bands around that didn't make it past the, you know, the Oxenford Tavern or whatever, but um, yeah, I don't know if, if they, c they certainly can't all exist, so I need to, hopefully the good ones are lucky. I don't know how to answer that really, it's sort of, if, I don't know if there's ever going to... Like, people sort of said that we filled the gap that Chisel had or something like that at some stage, but I don't tend to agree with that. I think we're more like Australian Crawl, <laughs> you know? <It's> like, I <laughs> don't know? There's the title of the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes? Yeah, it's rewarding to it's um, to see something do well is always satisfying, and um, just as much so if it's someone else. I think 
like I'm, I'm working with young, you know, young artists now, and of course I want it to be successful. Yeah. And all of the stuff that Chew Process does, or Create Control, the other thing that we're involved with, or Splendor, you know, we just want to hopefully do it, you know, do it for the right reasons. It's not, it's not a money-making exercise, really. Although, you know, you've got to run a business, but you want to put out good stuff and see it do well. We're going to have to wrap it up in a moment, but if there's one more, anybody else? Uh, I think if we could sum up, uh, or maybe it, it's hard, but that's what makes it good, isn't it? Playing in a band. It is, and I mean, it's quite absurd that I'm sitting here trying to, being asked to talk about it and all that stuff. I feel like I'm sort of, but you know, honoured to be asked, but sort of, it's probably pretty boring to a lot of people talking about stating the obvious. But I think if I could say anything to to young people, as you've got, to, we've been dwelling on it. You've just got to be persistent and just not do it for any other reason than you love music, because mm. otherwise you'll fail. Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, Ian Hogue. Thank you, Noel. Thanks, mate.